Hello there. Oh, it's loud. <laughs> I'm uh, Doug Shelley. I'm the uh, Vice President of Product Development at Tesora. Uh, today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Tesora and our database as a service uh, platform. So just a little bit of an overview on Tesora if you've never heard of us. Um, we are the Trove company. Trove is an OpenStack project. I hope everybody kind of knows about the database as a service project within OpenStack. Um, we've been involved for about a year. Um, in the last cycle, we were top contributor to the project in Juno, to the Trove project. Right now, we have about 10 developers in my group that are working on the project, and we have a, a one person on Trove Core, and he's sitting right there. <laughs> Wave, Amrith. <laughs> um, we have offices in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and near Toronto, which is where I'm from. Uh, so what we've built is an enterprise database as a service platform that's based on Trove. It's, uh, it says the most advanced Trove distribution available. I hazard to say it's probably the only Trove distribution available. Um, the, the goal of this distribution, one of the main goals is to provide enterprise support. We're really looking to support enterprises as they roll out databases as service, uh, particularly in private cloud. And one of the things we're doing is we're basically, and I'm going to talk more about this, but we're basically providing a certification of the databases that are supported within the platform and the distributions that run OpenStack. And I'll talk more about why that's important in a second. Um, we're, we also really want to be the uh, trusted advisor to the enterprise, not, not just merely hawking software to them, but talking to them about uh, challenges with database as a service, particularly in OpenStack, and you know, advising them on how they can roll that out in a way that makes sense to them. So one of the things we're going to talk about is what's unique about database as a service? So why is this different than other OpenStack projects? So if you attended uh, this, this session this morning by Jay Pipes and Peter Boros, which was all about <clears throat> MySQL running underneath OpenStack as the infrastructure database, you start to get some appreciation why databases are different than some of the other pieces of the, of the stack. Um, I think through their presentation, it certainly elicited some of the complexities of, of, of uh, managing MySQL in that environment. So, so kind of, we basically believe databases are different. Uh, there's administration management. Each one of the databases, uh, you know, like across MySQL, Mongo, Cassandra, they have their own personality. Some of them weren't actually engineered for the cloud, and that becomes material when you want to put it in a cloud. Um, and there's other systems that they rely on. And not only are databases different in this context, Trove is, is a different kind of project. Um, so basically, the Trove project, there's this concept of a guest agent, which is the proxy between the database and the rest of the OpenStack services, which is unique, to, which is kind of unique in the OpenStack ecosystem. Um, we want to provide consistent management across all the instances. Um, some of the other peculiarities are the databases require tuning and customization, and they're not, it's, not, it's not the same across all of the database types. So the, Tuning and customization for Mongo is different than the tuning and customization for MySQL, for example. Um, these guest agents can't be viewed like drivers. Uh, you know, drivers, I think, is a pretty common concept in the context of OpenStack. These things aren't really a driver. Um, and the Trove project, it actually sits on top of all the other services and leverages Nova, Cinder, Swift, uh, Keystone, Glance. So, with our platform, we're actually trying to address these differences in a way that's meaningful to the enterprise. So why would somebody want to use the Tesora Database as a Service Platform Enterprise Edition? So for three reasons. It's robust, it's supported, and it's interoperable. So by robust, um, not only are we help, we're adding, project, um, adding features upstream that enterprises need, so we're kind of driving uh, enterprise agenda within the, within the open source project. Um, so we just recently added replication to the community. I'm going to do a demonstration of that in a minute. Um, the, the uh, Enterprise Edition is interoperable, so we're doing a lot of testing um, uh, in our own environment, uh, testing across all the data stores and across all the distributions, which is something that isn't done in the community for this particular project. And we're providing support, so what enterprises expect, which would be 7 by 24 SLA type level support. Okay, so here's... Um, kind of your block diagram of what the offering is. So starting at the, um, the bottom left, I'm, oh, I didn't even realize, I'm standing in front of the slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. So <clears throat> 
we start, you know, we talk about OpenStack. So everything's sitting on top of OpenStack on the bottom. Then there's the Trove Database as a Service OpenStack project right here. So we're basically wrapping that entirely. Um, and the first offering we have is our Community Edition. So basically, the Community Edition tracks the, the stable releases of OpenStack. So we just released Community Edition 1.2, which would be basically Juno, Trove Juno. Um, and we basically provide some extra things, like the installation and configuration has been simplified, uh, making it you know, easy, obviously, to install and configure for enterprises. And we provide some extra management. And, it's, and, and it, the Community Edition has, it benefits from all the testing that we're doing, as I talked about. And we will provide maintenance and bug fixes against the Community Edition as things are rolled into the stable branches. On top of that is our Enterprise Edition. So here what we're looking to do is over time add enterprise features. And one of the things that we've done is actually accelerate some features into early release. So in early September, we released um, version 1.1 of our Enterprise Edition. It included some Juno features that we tested and accelerated into the release, such as replication. So people could have uh, enterprise access to that feature before it actually got released in, in, in Juno, which was end of October. Um, we, and then, as I said, the, the offering also includes the 7 by 24 support and SLAs. Um, over time, we're expecting to roll other features into Enterprise Edition that, that, could, that we would, generally speaking, upstream. But if the, if the feature doesn't make sense to the community, then it may not upstream. It depends what it is. So we're evaluating those kinds of things. Um, then on the right-hand side, another big part of our offering is these certified guest images. So as I mentioned, the... The Trove um, component is based, one of the comp core things about it is there's a guest, a guest agent, and a guest agent gets rolled into an image. And so when you tell Trove to provision an instance, it basically spawns a Nova instance and puts a guest image on it that's kind of pre-configured for, for what you're provisioning. So for example, if you say, I want a, Mo a MySQL database, it would go pull the image that's associated with MySQL and spark up Nova against that. So this has been particularly challenging for people that have been trying to use Trove over the time that we've been involved in the project because the community provides tooling for creating these images, but you know, it's just like a lot of other things, people have trouble using the tooling and they're asking questions and then you know, it's very challenging. So we decided to actually productize that. So these images are tested, certified by us and available for download as part of the platform. So when you run uh, the Enterprise or Community Edition, after you install it and it's configured, you basically run this command and it'll pull whatever images you want off our site and install them into your, into your um, database to service component. And we have images for all the databases that are currently supported. So like uh, MySQL, Percona, Mongo, Cassandra, Couchbase, Redis, I believe. And as I said, we've, we've, we're doing extensive testing on these images in the context of various distributions of OpenStack. Okay. I wanted to talk a little bit about the replication feature that we uh, worked with the community uh, to provide in the Juno release. Um, and specifically, it was around read replica provisioning for MySQL. So just give me a second here. So what did that include? So in, this is the first version of replication that was put into the Trove project. And we scoped it to include these um, features. So from a master MySQL instance that's been provisioned, you can, launch, um, you can launch a replica. You can launch more than one replica. Um, the replica gets bootstrapped from a snapshot taken of the master at the time the provisioning occurs. Um, it, it, currently, it's based off MySQL uh, native async replication. And it uses the bin log position. So it starts from a snapshot and, then, snapshot and then rolls forward based on the bin log position in the MySQL uh, master database. As I said, master can support many replicas, and there's a concept that a replica can be promoted or demoted. So you could basically take a replica and make it uh, the new master and knock the master uh, out. So it provides some. Uh, the target of the feature was actually to provide uh, read scale, but obviously, if you have many slaves, you could ultimately uh, promote one of them to be uh, the new master at any point in time that you wanted to. So. Let's get into this demo, which 
If you've seen me do this before, I like doing uh, video demos because they're significantly more predictable than relying on the vagaries of networking here. <laughs> so let's just go into this. So one of the other things that we bundle with community and Horizon, uh, community and enterprise edition of our product is a skinned Horizon that, uh, for the most part, is, is Horizon. Over time, we've provided uh, various fixes to it that may that go upstream but may not be available in the OpenStack, say, in, in IceHouse. We, put, we, we pulled some things back from Juno into IceHouse uh, for our versions to fix some bugs in Horizon. So. so here we go. We'll sign in. OK, so here we go to the database panel. Um, don't know if everybody's, oh, let me roll it up here. OK. If you're not really familiar with Trove, you would have never seen this panel, probably. If you don't have uh, Tesora DBAS or Trove installed in your OpenStack, you'd, you'd never get this uh, set of panels. But basically, that pops up when you have a database service installed. So in, it has an instances panel. So one of the things you can do on the right side there, you can uh, launch. And then the launch dialog will come up here. So. These are the things basically you provide when you want to provision a database. In the, uh, so <clears throat> you name it. You pick a flavor. Now, one of the things you can do is you can actually establish flavors that are specific to a database as a service. And the reason you'd want to do this is because uh, different, uh, these different guest images and different databases may have different requirements from the other flavors that you have for Nova, like they need more memory or uh, more uh, s system disk or whatever. So the other thing you can do, uh, I'll stop it there. You can also provide a volume. So what that'll actually do is um, spin up a Cinder volume and put the actual data directory for whatever the database is that you're provisioning onto that Cinder volume. Uh, you can imagine why that would be important. <laughs> um, then you pick which uh, data store and version you want. Um, in other uh, variations of this demo, we, you know, there'd be more. This will, this would represent whatever list of data stores that you have installed, um, and they all pop up, and then you pick the version. And the other thing you can do is you can have it create an initial database. So in the context of MySQL, it would that would be a database that shows up when you do like use database, and you can create an administrative user. So we'll just go ahead and do that. Test DB, test user, password. And I'm just going to go ahead here, click Launch. So now it shows up in here. Um, and it should launch relatively rapidly. <laughs> so what, it's, it's now active. You can see that on the right. I'm just going to click on it, which is basically the show command. And it's going to list out this. So this is my master. And you can see all the way down here is the basically the connection information. How do you get to it from whatever your application or client is? You can see that my user has been created and the database I made there, the test DB. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm just going to go into PHP admin kind of as like a canonical client and I'm going to jam some data into the database so that I can actually prove that replication worked. <laughs> so I'm just going to quickly uh, load some data, a schema and data that I have created, previously created. So here we go, customer demo schema. I'll just go ahead and populate that and then query it. So there, we have some data. OK. So now I'm going to uh, flip back to, to Horizon here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch another instance, and it's going to come up as a read replica. So we'll just go through here quickly. So name it, pick flavor. I'll pick the same flavor I used for the other one, MySQL. Now, under this advanced tab, now you have a choice. You can restore from backup, or you can now replicate from instance. So I'm going to pick my master. So this is going to launch this instance as a slave or a read replica from that master. So what it's doing right now, as you can see, it's backing up the master. And then it's going to send that backup over to, um, so the backup gets streamed to Swift. Then it's going to pull the backup off of Swift and uh, launch this new instance and restore that back up to it and then set up, you know, set up the MySQL replication, uh, con configure MySQL replication. 
So here we are doing a show now on the slave. So a couple things, here's its locator, and then you can see down here, it's now attached, it's slave of, of that master. And then master now shows that it has a slave. <clears throat> and you can also see that, and again, this makes sense because it replicated it, but it it's, it's now has the user and the database information that I put on the master. And now I'm going to go back into PHP my admin, and I'm going to connect to the slave, which I pre-configured with the address of that Nova instance. And I'm going to take a look at it and see if my data showed up there. So there it is. Oh, yeah, well, there's the schema. There's the data. Now, that's all well and good, but the point, actually the point of replication isn't to get the starting point. It's to actually be able to you know, change data on the master as you go and have it show up on the slave. So I'm just going to prove that it got configured properly and that the data will make it across. So I reconnect to my master, and I'm going to just go change a piece of data. Here we go. I'm going to jack up my credit limit, I think, is what this table's for. There we go. It's going to change that to some number, 5,000. And so now I've just updated my map, did an update SQL statement on my master. I'm now going to just go over to my slave. And hopefully, that change will have made it. What do you think? Do you think it made it? <laughs> I should make a version of the demo where that doesn't work. Then it, people would believe that it's real. <laughs> there we go, 5,000. OK. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm forced my way onto the instance, and I'm going to kill my SQL to show what happens if the master goes down. So when the master goes down, it shows in this detached state, and the slave replication gets shut down on it because um, the rep that's kind of uh, what happens when replication, when my master goes away, the replication stops. Now what I'm going to do is start the master back up, and you can see that this basically, he'll come back to active, and the replication will start again. And the last thing I'm going to demonstrate is basically the detach operation. So you can hit this detach command on the uh, slave, and it basically will, well, <laughs> It's hard to see. It, it, it's turned off the replication, which I'm going to show, but it stays as an instance. It's now just independent of the master. So if you go into the show, you'll notice that the, replica, the slave of information is gone. I think, I think that's the demo. Oh, I'm going to go into the master and show that the, it doesn't have any slaves anymore. OK. Oh, it's starting again. Let me just go back here. OK, so that was my demo. Um, OK, so that's kind of the, what I had today. Um, we have a booth right over there, which is uh, E36. Um, please come and visit us. Uh, lots of people there to answer any questions you have. Um, we have a caricature artist who will draw a really nice caricature of you and give it to you. Um, and we have some swag. Everybody wants some swag. We have some swag. So, so thank you for, uh, oh. Question, I got one and a half minutes. Go ahead. Right, so very good question. He's asking about what about high availability in the context of this feature. So as I said, we scoped the initial MySQL replication kind of tightly so we could get it done. And it was scoped to include only read replicas. We are now scoping version two of that feature, and it's going to include failover features. And that's being worked, in fact, um, there's a design summit session where we're going to be talking about that on Thursday. So the intention is that'll be in Kilo. So we have 50 seconds. Anybody <laughs> got another question? <laughs> okay, as I said, feel free to come by and talk to us over the week. Thank you very much. <laughs>